So, um, uh, I've been a physicist as uh, was mentioned, um, but um, and that to a particle physicist who kind of uh, never even thinks of reality is always at the levels of what are particles made of, which most of them you can't see them. Um, but then I kept uh, feeling in my, uh, while I was doing my masters, is why is it that surrounding me, there are so many things, so beautiful, so symmetric. Symmetry is one major thing that you study in particle physics um, as a major uh, universal law. Uh, breaking of symmetry itself is a major uh, uh, um, event to occur. So I used to think that uh, how come, I mean, uh, everything is so beautiful, symmetric, and it's not once, it keeps happening generation after generation. So where do these laws come from? Where do these, how do these things happen? And I, uh, since I did not have any biology from my school onwards in our system and the class uh, of eight you finish biology, if you don't want to continue biology, you take maths and other subjects and don't do. I had very little idea about uh, how things are, but I made some effort to learn and talk to a whole lot of my colleagues who were very nice, all biologists, uh, very nice to teach me from the uh, first principles how things work in biology, at least whatever is known. And that is how I have been very interested in, in all sorts of uh, areas in biology. And that has made me both uh, a, a person who is useful and useless, because I am very useless in areas where you are going very deep into, into one particular aspect of uh, my research. But uh, useful because I give these courses on computational biology and theoretical biology to undergraduates and postgraduates now. And I realized that I'm the only one probably who can uh, teach them from ecology to genomics uh, in one go. Um, it's taken me 25 years to learn biology, um, whatever little I have understood. So it's easier to talk to many of you now uh, so that I understand what you're doing. And I give all that credit to my biology colleagues who trained me. So um, epidemiology or uh, modeling infectious disease is one of my areas of research and I've been spending a lot of time lately trying to do things uh, with not too much of success for various reasons. Uh, but I thought I'll tell you about uh, what we uh, uh, do. So as you know, so, um, since many of you work in these areas that when you study diseases, especially infectious disease, in any institution you go or any department you go, you will have people doing genetics, people doing cell biology, people doing biochemistry, same disease, maybe malaria, maybe HIV, but each group is doing it separately. But we know when you look at the disease in a population over a long period of time, it's an amalgamation of all these scales that give rise to a case, a particular case of a disease in, in the population. So essentially when you are trying to understand the temporal pattern of disease in population, it is uh, outcome of all these processes happening at all these different scales, uh, 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 effect of all of them. So that's why it is good to have an idea about how these different scales match. We have not been able to match scales even, in the even theoretically, even mathematically it's one of the most difficult uh, jobs to match time scales and space scales. But uh, people ha at least have understood that finally it has to be uh, one single effort where we would be able to understand at each these levels and put them together to understand how the disease moves. So for example, if you look at this, this is a very uh, uh, textbook photograph or picture from about malaria. As you, many of you know, maybe all of you know that malaria has two hosts, the mosquito and the human, malaria parasite, I mean. And it lives half the time in the human host and half the time in, inside the insect. This is what is happening inside an infected person or an infected mosquito. But what do we see when I'm trying to study in, in uh, the incidence of a disease? For example, in 1976, India had a malaria epidemic. And this is just a, a, a picture which shows which are the states. These are different 22 states in, in that, uh, at that time. Now we have many more. What was the extent of infection at, in all these different states? So when somebody goes from one to the other, there is a whole lot of other events that influence that starting from the disease happening inside the host to 
evolution or incidence of a case. And that is where all the other areas like social interaction, migration patterns, ecology, uh, and environmental factors, all of them come in. And therefore, when we try to model this also, all these things, there's this class of models which happen over the, uh, in the first uh, picture that I showed. There's another class of model that happens, uh, that one writes down as you would like to do it. So when we are talking about uh, uh, evolution of um, a disease in a particular area, I just showed you this biological scales. But there's another set of scales that make an uh, important contribution. That is the processes happening at different time scales and different length scales in the sense different space. There's again a picture which tells you that if you're people who work on mosquito, uh, the biology in mosquito, larval de development takes, happens within a meter of a pond meters and it takes within 21 days. But if you talk about people who are working on with mosquitoes, they would talk about mosquitoes can fly. So things are happening over hundreds of meters of scale and it also takes days and months. And when you talk about weather, you talk about human migration. So the entire scale changes. Things happen and over time now, migration over um, kind of thousands of kilometers happen over uh, kind of half, uh, just a few hours. And that's how lately infectious disease has become a global problem only because it can move from one part of uh, space to another part. And if you take of weather, global warming, then all these things are continuously interacting all these spatial and temporal scales are continuously interacting to affect the disease incidence, disease prevalence, and disease spread. So therefore, when we try to model infectious, infectious disease, it, uh, we have to keep this in mind, and we have to model, we have to look at models at multiple scales. So but why model? Essentially, most, um, I mean, I have experiences of biologists coming and telling me, all models are useless, they don't serve any purpose because they are just too general. Okay? I have modelers coming and telling me, of course I am one of them, saying that, oh God, it's impossible to talk to the biologists, they are always talking in so much detail. But we have to be able to um, get to ask for any parameter value, they say, oh, it will take us two years to get that parameter. Now, since I worked with biologists, I know it does take more than a year to get one parameter reliably. So, it's there are problems on both sides and we need to worry about how to manage this. But you know, disease modeling over years have reached a situation where it's now one of the most important things for prediction. All the, all the predictions that you hear about influenza, about uh, any disease that people say it's going up, it's coming down, is completely based on these models. So um, I will give you some idea about those. But a good model is one which considers all the relevant biological processes that are happening in the host, in the pathogen, and put them into, into some mathematical framework, which is considered to be representing that kind of a process. And that mathematical framework or the model should be able to predict or should be able to describe the disease incidence in past and should be able to describe, should be able to predict disease in incidence in, in future reliably. And that is what a model does. And at least infectious disease is one area where models have been used much more um, uh, in a much better manner than any other area. Okay. So there are some of us who have been uh, into this into this area for a long time. We all started with very simple models. These are called generic models. For example, for malaria, Ross built the first Ronald Ross. Sir Ronald Ross gave the first model in, two th uh, in, in 1801, uh, 1802. That was a very simple model. But that model within a few years may, were made into slightly more complex model. And based on that, the entire mosquito um, the system uh, that WHO took to kill all the mosquitoes was based on the model because the person who made that model, McDonald, actually was a WHO um, senior officer. And we know that it, it took away malaria from the entire world. It, it reduced malaria incidence uh, prevalence in the entire world. But there are long term repercussions that we have seen in terms of uh, resistant strains, etc., which was not possible for the model to speak about because the model never considered all those things. So it's very important that you know what you're putting into the model. 
lately, uh, when you're working on a specific disease, what you need is specific models or complex models, where the specific processes that happen inside the host and the pathogen and their interaction are put into mathematical forms, and the data that that particular model should uh, uh, describe should be of, should also be possible to get from the disease data that is available. So, um, in infectious disease modeling, there are. Uh, before I go into the into the talk, let me tell uh, what my group does. It's a very small group. We have looked at uh, infectious disease modeling at many scales. One of the things that I'm going to talk about here is a large scale analysis of HIV genome to study HIV human interaction. Um, we also have, as an offshoot of that, we have also developed several alignment free computational uh, methods for phylogenetic analysis. You can't call it phylogenetic analysis because it's alignment free. But it is phylogenetic classification from the point of view of separation of very closely related genomes, for example, in HIV subtype, sub subtype, CRFs that is circulating recombinant forms, which otherwise the genomes are so close that standard uh, methods do not work very reliably. We have also been looking at uh, molecular dynamics, uh, looking at the proteins of HIV, for example, our uh, reverse transcriptase, we, uh, HIV reverse transcriptase. The, the structure of the protein is known, the structure of inhibitor, the drug bound uh, large number of structures are known. Also the structures of these things called resistant mutants where the inhibition is released even though the inhibitor is bound to the structure because of certain mutations. We have been working on that uh, using network analysis and molecular dynamics. So the protein uh, side also we do some work. Um, we do met, uh, metabolic ana pathway analysis using um, Boolean network uh, models and flux balance analysis for biochemical pathways which, which are involved in host pathogen interaction. For example, many of you know that um, one of the best dr drug targets for let us say MTB is uh, one of the pathways which are not present in human but is present in the uh, pathogen. So those are the pathways that you can target, but you need to know how they interact with it. And finally, epidemiological models. So the first and the last one is what I am going to talk about. The last one is on malaria. So the plan is something of this kind. Let us see where we reach finally. Um, the first one is whole genome analysis of HIV-1 to study host pathogen coevolution. And the second one is epidemiological modeling of malaria. I will show you about a realistic mathematical model without getting much into detail. Uh, I may not be have the time to talk about statistical modeling, though that is what the entire government uses to predict uh, cases, uh, future cases. And some unpublished, um, uh, fair amount of that is unpublished, and some spatial temporal analysis of Indian malaria data, that is what I will show you. Okay, so the first one is uh, on host pathogen. How do you study host pathogen coevolution without doing experiments? There's something which I would like to show you, which I think it's not very difficult to do, especially for biologists. It's much more easier to do than a mathematician or a physicist because they know the biology very well. So, what is it that we want to look at? So, the word which is very common when you look at host when you uh, talk about host pathogen interaction is arms race. I do not have to describe that in this uh, audience that it is both the pathogen is trying to increase its fitness because it wants to make more, more and more of itself by killing the host cells and the host is continuously trying to improve its immune arsenal so that it can it does not get killed itself to sur make its own survival um, uh, more uh, increasing its own fitness. Of course, the host has to survive because some of these especially for HIV the pathogen needs to propagate only when there is a host. So, um, it is important to identify some of these selective constraints that regulate host pathogen adaptation uh, and which is critical to clinical management. So, the application part is very relevant, but the analysis part is does not worry about application, it is just uh, uh, what you uh, what you do with the wholly sequenced genomes that you have. So, um, we all know of uh, HIV uh, 1, HIV is a translational parasite which essentially means that it requires the host and it requires all the host's molecular machinery including the entire transcription, translation and machinery to for its own survival. It's, it, it has 9 genes, 3 of them are structural genes which are more most worked out 
the envelope gene, the gag gene, and the polymerase gene. And there are six regulatory genes, which are uh, which are also used for the uh, virus's survival, for its function, and um, its maintenance. Um, HIV is highly genetically diverse and high rates of mutation, very high, very frequent recombination and multiple cross species transmission has given rise to its genetic diversity. Along with high mutation rate, its latency, its ability to invade the host defense mechanism, all this has also made it very difficult for, for any kind of foolproof strategy to have a vaccine, vaccine or its um, any, any of a uh, way to stop it. This is an old slide, but I like this slide because it not only gives you all the subtypes, HIV-1 has a large number of subtypes, Sub, each, many of the subtypes have sub-subtypes and over and above them, many of these subtypes actually recombine and make these circulating recombinant forms. So this picture is though old, so the numbers may not be relevant, but it just tells you that how the picture has also changed a little even in India, that how, how much the different subtypes and sub-subtypes and the CRFs are distributed all over the world. Okay. Now, uh, when we look at it from the point of view of, um, of uh, what uh, it is, it does, the, the, sorry. So, um, you know, when, uh, when people look at the evolution, when people do the evolutionary studies of of HIV, they are mostly done on these structural genes. Two reasons, one of them is people think structural genes are the ones where the proteins are there and they are the ones which do the major jobs, they are the ones which make the envelope, they are the ones which um, tra uh, reverse transcribe and uh, integrate. So um, uh, also they are large genes. So most of the studies are mostly on the structural genes. Um, longitudinal studies, that is studies within the patient has shown that the HIV is under positive selection. So the way you see it is when you do the phylogenetic analysis over time, it has a very temporal sequence pattern, very beautiful papers on this. But when you look at it at the population level, you see that there is no pattern in the, in the phylogenetic tree when you pick up all these sequences from different populations. And therefore, the, the general, there is a one view that it says that it is the mutational drift that is because of high genetic diversity also um, tells you that it is probably the um, drift that essentially allows the um, uh, population, uh, the HIV um, in the, uh, at the, uh, um, move at the population level. Okay. So, the, but what people haven't done and that's what we did in, in very simple computational analysis is nobody has looked at all the genes separately, all the nine genes to study along with the whole genome to study what is the real status of it in populations vis-a-vis -vis inside a patient. Okay. So that's what we did in this study. In this study, basically you look at the evolutionary patterns with respect to the human host human genome and then for that, of course, there is, uh, 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 there is this huge kind of database uh, resource which is housed in um, Los Alamos National Laboratory which is basically the HIV's major uh, resource and um, well from a, a, a laboratory which made the atomic bomb now this is one of the best users they have and they, have, they spend a lot of money and time in doing infectious disease research whatever be their uh, whatever is their um, idea for doing it. So um, you can get everything there, it's a, it's a hugely, greatly, I'm glad that they have it for people like us uh, who can just download the sequences, very well curated sequences also. So there are whole genome sequences deposited from 1983 to 2005. So when we uh, did this work, there were about 1431 whole genome sequences for 23 years, they collected from different clades and geographical regions. Obviously, subtype B, which is more predominant in US and Western Europe is larger in number, but still there are from all different regions. We also did the entire study on these 10,600 gene sequences separately. And uh, I would tell you why initially we did the study because they were larger in number. But then when I went and discussed with people who run this place, a uh, lady called Betty Corber and she uh, told me that it's good to do it, you do the gene analysis but do it from the whole genome. 
So the reasons uh, are that each of these genes are sequenced by different people in different labs in different kind of conditions, whereas the whole genome is sequenced by the same lab. And you cut out all the genes from the same genome. They have a cutting um, tool also. So you at least that kind of bias will be gone. So sometimes it's useful to talk to people who are also developing the databases instead of just taking the data from there. Okay. So um, what what is it that we do? So if you if you look at it, HIV is a AT rich virus, okay, and we know that humans are GC rich, okay, and I already told you that HIV and human is coexisting for many many years. HIV is completely dependent on human resource, cellular resources for its transcription. So this is just to show you that over all these 23 uh, years, zero, here the number of sequences mean these are the early sequences, these are the late sequences. So HIV, the sequence HIV in general has maintained very high percentage of A and T and medium, uh, medium level of G and C. Okay. You can uh, look at it for the genes also, the way you um, after cutting using the cutting tool. These are the different genes, ENB, GAG and for all these nine genes and this is the human, the base composition in humans and the base composition in the genes. All the HIV genes exhibit similar high A richness except REV which is indicated here which is similar to the human which you can see is more or less similar. If you do something what is known as the neutrality plot and many of you I think all of you know that if you want to look at um, transcription, translation, etc. You need to know about codon usage. If you look at codons, you also know that there is something called third position bias in sequences. So there is this thing called neutrality plot that you have to see. But what is the positioning of these GNC nucleotides to understand that okay, uh, organism can be A rich, but it could be that its third position is a lot of GNC, just to give an idea that it really doesn't matter even if it's A and D rich. You see here it is done for humans and the other nine genes. You can see that human most third position is G and C. So it makes G C rich codons and on all the um, HIV genes especially Paul gene has very low G C 3 content. So these are ways of uh, looking at uh, base composition and uh, codon usage to understand how the base composition affects the um, trans, uh, translational uh, bias. Okay, so um, uh, if you look at the 83 codons, uh, 83 bias in these genes, it's even greater than the overall 80 bias. You, what one does is then one takes all these genes for all the 23 years, you and find out the codon usage of all these genes. Okay, you don't do all the 62, you do 59 because there are some codons as you know which are only one copy, for example start, stop, tryptophan, etc. You take the other 59 codons of 9 genes for 23 years and do what is known as the multivariate analysis. It is a statistical analysis tool which wants to separate or uh, any, any, anything that you are studying, in this case these are the genes based on the usage of based on its property. So that is since there are multiple variables that you have to consider and uh, generally in biostatistics courses they will only teach you two variable one. So you can do that for multivariable ones and this is the kind of what they call it a by plot that shows you if you look at all the 59 codons for all the 23 years of the 9 genes this is how they look in, in this plot with respect to humans. So you can see that the, there is a Klein, which means that there is human there, closest to it is Rev, which also tells you, I showed you that Rev is closer to it, and the rest of them are fairly far away from there. Look at the structural genes, they are the farthest away. Okay. So this itself should tell people, but I do not know why one does not look at these. Okay. So that tells that there is a Klein. What you can do after this is, you want to find out how far they are, you just simply take the distance between this and this, distance between this and that and then you do what is known as use these kind of clustering algorithm which all anybody who does phylogeny knows about these things. Most of the time you put the data in a software it gives, gives it out to you but most of us when we do we actually go into the details of the software to find out what it is done. 
it can be done for anything. It doesn't only have to be sequences. So because those are statistical techniques. So if you do that, this is how the tree, the dendrogram looks. As, as I had shown earlier, Rev is closest to the human and these three are farthest. So it's just another way of looking at it instead of looking at numbers and expressions. Now this is when all the 23 years are taken together. You can do the same analysis which is now called principal competent analysis and the same multivariate analysis as statistical modeling technique. You take for each of these 23 years for the average human codon usage value and also highly expressed genes. These are the kind of things that the reviewers ask you. So this is how it looks. Okay. So let me just tell you what this is. So you have 9 genes, you have 59 codons. So 9 into 59. And for each year, you are trying to figure out where is my, what is the uh, relationship of the codon usage pattern in these nine genes with respect to my human, the standard human genome from where the codons are found. Okay? So there are 23 points on each of these nine clusters. You see how tightly clusters the, um, these three structural genes are, which means when the clusters are tightly, which means there has not been much of variation there. When there is loosely clustered, means there has been variation in codon usage over time. So what you can do the same thing. This is slightly more complicated because you want to find out if there is variation, how much of the variation you need can, how many components of this principal component analysis can explain. So we see that about 6 components takes, explains 90 percent variation. So what we again do the same thing. We, you can do the same thing with human highly expressed genes. It looks something like that. This is the kind of thing you do because you have to tell the reviewer that average is as good because if you consider the uh, human highly expressed genes, they are further away from the average. So at the most, I am underestimating. I am not overestimating. Okay? So these are exactly the way you do controls in your experiments. We also have to do these things. Okay, so what we do is we find out the distance of each of these points from this in this three dimensional coordinate system. In fact, we take six dimensions because six components and find out very simple just like finding out distance between two points and then you plot that distance with, with time. Okay? So how does it look? This is how it looks. So what have I plotted here? Here is the year. So 1983 for example, the TAT gene, the distance of the human, so it has been scaled with respect to one with the maximum. The distance between the TAT gene and the human average codon usage pattern of TAT gene codon usage and thing was somewhere here. Over time till about 2000, the codon usage pattern seems in TAT gene seems to have come down. And then for reasons I do not know, it seems to be, have gone up. Okay? This is what the data tells you. This is for REV. REV is the one which seemed to be the closest. Uh, with human. You can see that there also you see the tr uh, trend of coming down um, and then you can see that there is a. Of course, everybody will ask you what does. So here you can see these are statistical uh, parameters, um, the confidence levels and um, um, the errors that uh, would tell you that is your, your data, the fit of your data is kind of fairly good certainly better than 0.5, but in biology data where you are unable to get rid of data which you do not like in experiments which many times students do, they do not like the data, they think it is not matching, so they will throw it away. We cannot do it here because the genomes are already there. It is highly, you can see how much variation is there, but this is a kind of values which you consider to be good because that is all that a noisy data can give you. But why this reversal? We do not know. And this, uh, the, we can only conjecture that you know there's something called selection pressure, and from late 90s, l l from 96, 97, 98, the entire ART therapy, that is antiretroviral therapy, came into uh, um, being, came into the population, and since then there are lots of things that happen to HIV patients, and one of them that the uh, the, uh, the the the, the Pathogen was continuously under a lot of pressure, selection pressure, which was coming with the heart therapy. And whether that has, whenever there is selection pressure, the way the um, uh, organism would evolve or 
it's completely unknown. That would depend on many other constraints. But certainly it will not evolve the way it was, because now it has an additional selection acting on it. So that could be one of the reasons, but we have no way to prove. Of course, the reviewer would tell you that, you know, this will not work. You have to show me that the expression of the, these genes were different at this time and expression are different, which I don't have, because even the transcription expression um, databases don't give you what were the relative expressions for these genes in 1983 and what it is now, because nobody thinks about these things unless you see them. But uh, certainly this is how the results are. You could, uh, um, so one of, now this doesn't happen to all the genes by the way. Of the nine genes, only two of them show this. Now to prove this, there are a lot many results which I haven't shown gets done. First of all, you have to show that it is not the result of different gene lengths. So you have to do controls for that. You have to show that it is not due to overlap of genes. HIV genome has huge overlap on of these genes and small, small pieces overlapping at different points. So you have to do controls for that. And then of course you have to do a whole lot of statistical tests which will take away um, false positives, which will also we have found Euclidean distance, simple distance between the two. You have to show that this result also is valid for other kind of distances. And there are a whole lot of nice names for those distances, probabilistic distances. So those things were all done. So the paper has a lot more of stuff, but this is just to tell you, this is one way of looking at how things work. You also do these kinds of uh, other kind of statistical analysis to tell you that most of the data actually falls within 95% percent confidence interval, so your, your results are fairly reliable. Okay? So mm, you, you can, y what you have got is not something just out of random um, even that is happening, but something which is reliable happened which you can explain, uh, which you can describe reliably through your results. So um, in this, I don't want to uh, go any more into detail unless somebody wants to discuss. But what have I shown? I have shown that the codon usage pattern has changed with time in a pathogen, in two pathogen genes with respect to its host. Now, what is codon usage pattern changing? Obviously, due to some mutation, otherwise, how will the pattern, uh, how will these things change? But these are synonymous mutations, okay? So, you are not changing the, changing the um, protein, but you are changing the uh, sequence in such a way that uh, it's just that uh, the, the am amino acid is changing, okay? But it certainly acts like a weak selective force. It's important to say that there are groups of people in evolutionary biology who think that synonymous changes have no role in evolution. What we are trying to say is that they are a weak selective force and it can actually lead to some kind of um, evolutionary changes. Essentially in this case, the differential synonymous codon usage pattern can act, can act like a method to regulate translation. Okay. And that is what the uh, host and pathogen are uh, using with respect to all these um, uh, changing its patterns of, uh, uh, patterns of interaction. So we do show uh, temporal change in regulatory genes. So um, Gag, Paul do not show any of these differences. Um, it's all, so this regulatory genes in that case certainly tells, uh, gives up a, a uh, um, uh, adds to the belief that the population level uh, evolution of HIV is neutral because they, they are happening through the um, uh, changes through the synonymous changes. Now, given that this is what we have, that you can um, you know these pa uh, pattern in some of the pathogen genes in have positive translation selection. It's not just by uh, random mutational drift. There has to be have some implication in vaccine development because vaccine development has always gone for the structural genes. What we are trying to say is that's not the right one. So essentially what the study tells you that both REV and TAT are likely candidates for developing therapies rather than those very tightly regulated uh, structural genes. They are, um, and uh, it could be one, uh, in fact TAT is used lately. Uh, people are looking at TAT much more than anything else. So there are, uh, it's, a, it's not very um, difficult. They are useful things and they, they can have implications in something more than what we 
do. So, um, this is where I would like to just to give you some idea about how people go on about. We did the same analysis with those 10,000 genes, a lot more noise, uh, exactly the reason why she, they told us not to base our analysis. But certainly, there also between all these nine genes, the Rev and TAT had a more clear signature than any other. Now, I'll go to the exactly other scale, which is population. So here also, in some sense, it was population because the genomes were collected at a population level, but they were still genomic analysis, genome level analysis. Now we are looking at cases. So in this case, what are we looking at? We are looking at epidemiological modeling, which is very common in public health, in epidemiology. Every medical institution would have an epidemiology department. Uh, India itself has huge Indian Council of Medical Research, which, uh, which basically dominate and uh, regulate all the disease research in India. Extremely difficult to get data from them. So what I would tell you is, to give you an idea, since none of you do, that um, how to develop and analyze a realistic mathematical model. I don't think I will go into that unless uh, there is no time. And I will show you this because I think it's interesting to look at. Okay, so what is epidemiological model? Epidemiological models are basic models of infectious disease. It essentially talks about how is infection spreading in a population. They divide the entire population into four groups. A group of susceptible individuals, hosts, some a group of exposed individuals, infected hosts and recovered. There can be n number of subgroups in them, the most common one being the recovered group having immunity or not having immunity. They will depend on which disease you are talking about, this will depend on a whole lot of other things. Now, if, you are, if a mathematician is giving this talk and somebody who has not been in a biology laboratory like me, if you ask them how do you decide, you go to a population, how do you decide who is S, who is E, and who is I? other than the fact that in malaria somebody is having fever and somebody is not having fever. Okay. So, um, you can do that and people do that. They find out all these clinical markers. So, here is my S, E, I and R. The color code is for the uh, parasite uh, de density in the host and in the exposed and the infected class you will find that if you do a polymerase uh, chain reaction for the pathogen genome, then it will be positive. It will um, in, in the infected class, it will show both the cellular um, seroconversion also is positive, but no long, uh, long time cellular immunity. Okay. So, based on these three clinical markers, people can in some sense separate a population into, two, into these classes. There are lots of problems here, people who do these they know. In fact, I just want to uh, mention about one paper that came out in Lancet two, three years back. The government data on malaria in India is there are 1200 deaths per in a year. This paper came out in Lancet saying there are 12,000 deaths. So, obviously, there was a big problem for the government, so for ICMR. So, the problem there was that how do you say that this, uh, this particular fever there is a way to uh, uh, know that this is an infected case. That when you go and ask, did you have fever? They will say, yes, we had fever. So, uh, and given the 1.2 billion people that we have, most of them in, in villages, to go and find out and taking uh, these answers is not the best thing to do. So, government uh, said the no, the data collection was not correct, etc. So, a whole lot of things that go behind these numbers which when you go to work in, the, in this, these areas, you get to know. Okay. So, again, when you build a mathematical model, you have to consider the basic processes of infection between the host and the pathogen. And then, your idea is to give some future trend prediction. Okay. But the problem is, given that what the data you have is just a number, that in 1976, the total number of malaria cases in India was this number. So, it is something like matching a n parameter multivariable model to a sequence of single numbers. So, there is huge indetermination involved in these. So, when you work and when you try to parameterize these models, there are huge mathematical and computational problems there. And it is only people who work in these areas, they know just exactly when we ask for parameters to uh, experimentalize the kind of problems are there, they only would know. 
Okay. So let me talk about uh, this particular model um, and uh, just to give you an idea how do people go about modeling in epidemiology. So here are my compartments. In this particular model in malaria, the susceptible, susceptible ones get exposed on mosquito bites, infected mosquito bites. So there is this host compartment, there is this um, mosquito compartment, infected mosquitoes transfer individuals from susceptible to exposed. Exposed ones then develop disease. They can be symptomatic or asymptomatic, which means they can show fever and may not show fever. There can be conversion from asymptomatic to symptomatic. There could conversion could be a, uh, natural or could be again due to an infected mosquito bite. And then if a mosquito bites these two groups, then the susceptible mosquito can be exposed. Okay? And hence, this entire interaction will go on. Then there is when they become um, when they are when they recover either through drug or naturally both of them have certain rates all these values uh, numbers sorry letters that are given there they are uh, they are given here they are basically parameters which tell you the birth rate uh, death rate um, rate of recovery um, then duration of exposed class etc etc the kind of things that is important in in uh, epidemiology rate of transmissions etc I do not want to talk about this model, it is already published, the mathematical model is already published. I will just flash the equations to you and not talk about it, okay? so do not get scared. So these are the equations, okay? there are four, as, you, as I told you, there are seven variables, four humans and three mosquitoes and there are so many parameters and each of these parameters, these expressions are one of the processes that happens between the host and pathogen. So what we did was, and that's published. So I'm not so interested in talking about this. This model is not published. You can't. It's impossible to find out how many mosquitoes are there. There you need to know how many mosquitoes are infected, how many mosquitoes are susceptible, how many mosquitoes are um, are, are there. That's impossible to find out experimentally. So what we did in this particular model is that we took out the entire mosquito group and introduced the mosquito infection effect of the mosquito through something called force of infection. So now there are slightly smaller number of, um, of uh, uh, terms in the, in the model, but this model is uh, very important because this model considers, these are humans, okay? so it considers all the immunity factors into the model. And the kind of malaria, we know that malaria is, high, is mostly a children's disease. And Small kids get more affected than slightly older kids. So we, um, there are experimental epidemiological data to tell what is the way the infection goes up and uh, peaks around four years, three years or four years, then they come down. For adults are much more um, uh, kind of resistant to malaria. So that is one graph which we all models have to first tell that my model actually uh, describes that graph. So the model basically talks about that the probability of infection depends on mosquito bites, of course, and the immunity of the host, which is age dependent. And then it writes down all these equations. Don't worry about those. Here are clinical immunity, antiparasitic Im immunity, one of them which comes to the child from the mother and the other one which comes because of mosquito bite. So all these have certain time scales. So all these expressions that are given for these things, they have time scales built into these parameters, so this, this developing this model took some time. The important thing here is this, which is the so-called force of infection, which is telling me about how the infection is coming from the um, mosquitoes. And that depends on what is the infectious bites per day per person, that is entomological inoculation rate. It also depends on how many infectious bites will induce infection, not all of them do. So that proportion is also important and also it has to be age dependent because we know that malaria infection is age dependent. So that is the term that will go here and we have taken out a huge section of the earlier model that we talked about. So you need two things, one is the model, then you need numbers of the parameters. Here are the, all these numbers, some of them are available, uh, we got from this particular paper, some of them we got the baseline value and worked around it, some of them we estimated from our, for our work. All right, so we have numbers, we have the model. Now you have to show that the model works, 
So how do you do that? So here is the Indian map, some of you who know Indian map. So we took data, so there is a small uh, short data sets available, mostly from NGOs by the way, not from the government, for different places. So we picked up three different regions and we took um, um, uh, epidemiological uh, disease incidence or disease prevalence data. This area which is in northeast which is very high uh, and highly endemic in um, malaria and these two which have slightly different uh, environmental and ecological and weather uh, conditions and I will show you the data set here. Here is the data set. So high endemic northeast you can look at the y axis so you can see how different these values are. Okay. So this is high, this is intermediate and this is low. These are different kind of uh, numbers of data. This goes up to 47 uh, months, this is 60 months and this is 36 months. And you can see this is how the disease data, incidence data looks like. My model with all those numbers and parameters have to be, should be able to explain this and predict these numbers. So how do you go about it? There are different things people do. So what we did was one thing that uh, as all models have to show the age dependence and also that malaria essentially goes up and then it stabilizes. So every individual or every population will have a stable value. What you see here as things going up and down. So how does this happen? So be, uh, this is where you have to uh, understand how malaria works. And so I will show you with one of the data sets, the middle one because it is a more complex data set. Because this data set if you look at the Mangalore one, you see that over and above it going up and down, it also has something what is known as the trend. And so people who work on time series analysis and the most interested ones in this case are the ones who are interested in financial mathematics, those who want to look at how the share indices go up and down. So there you also look at trend value which is a long term trend you look at and short term trend. You do that in time series analysis in all sorts of data. In this case you can see that here is a trend which went up and come, uh, came down. We do not know why this was. So we do not have it in our model. So we have to get this out of the, out of the data set. So you can get the trend out, you can detrend the data and take this out and then this is what it looks like. You can see that now the trend is gone but the short term fluctuations are all there. Uh, now I have my model has to be able to predict this. So for that I am I leave this out this part for prediction to show that the model works and take the rest of it to um, use in my data. So how to fit this model to disease prevalence pattern of course first thing you do is you know that malaria is dependent on mosquitoes. Mosquitoes are dependent on rainfall at least in all the third and so called non so third world countries like India now. Um, you have something called monsoon which rains in that particular time and the, this is the rainfall pattern in Mangalore for these particular years you can get them from the um, uh, 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 weather uh, department. So what you do is you take all that data and you try to fit the, the disease prevalence pattern with respect to the rainfall pattern because rainfall certainly is going to have an effect. And since the model did not have any of those what everything has to go into the force of infection but because that is what is going to increase the number of mosquitoes. So how what we do is we increase, incre include the environmental factors into the force of infection by introducing a term uh, called ENV and that ENV would have an average yearly fluctuation due to the rainfall and short random fluctuations because of the rainfall not being the same exactly the same every year. And you fit this particular rainfall pattern for each of those data sets with certain mathematical functions and then what you do is you this is the three data sets that I showed you. The dotted line is the actual um, uh, case prevalence and the sorry the blue line is the case prevalence and the dotted line is the one or the other way around probably um, is what we have fitted using the ENV. 
Now, I don't change the, uh, change the model at all. So there are something like 12 parameters in that model, which was kept constant for all the three data sets. All I change are only these two parameters, which is essentially representing the environmental factors. So what I show is, out of those 15 parameters, I keep all those other parameters are the host factors, which I'm not changing because they're all Indians. Okay. So I don't change host factors. I only change environmental factors, and I fit these three rainfall data to the, um, to the um, disease prevalence pattern. I'm showing you this one. Uh, sorry, this one. So let's see how it looks. I use these two, um, take these two parameters, fit them uh, for all the three geographic regions. And this is how my model looks. Now with my model, with all the these two extra parameters, blue is the detrended data, red is the model. Let me tell you, there is this model is what is known as the deterministic model, which means I don't include any stochastic variation in this. If you do a stochastic model, that is you introduce noise into the model, these which is most realistic, the you will have more variation into this. But then you put the trend back. The red one, that is the uh, model with the trend back, looks like this. So this is the simulated data, and with the uh, the um, uh, actual prevalence data, this is how it looks. And therefore, the model that we built basically works quite well because you can see from this uh, uh, variance uh, explanation of variance that it's about 70 percent of the data is uh, variance is being explained. So we can use the uh, quite a complex model, which is representative of the host biology. In this particular case, in malaria, you, because it has a lot of effect in coming from the environment, we can include the environmental factors and therefore not really meddle with the model much and fit the model fairly well with respect to. We have done this with African data. All that is supposed to be published. We haven't done that. I'll just get the um, statistical model out because statistical model is not my um, of my interest, but essentially it does prediction, and that is what government actually takes most of the most of that. So, um, how do we look at? I'll take another five minutes if you can allow me to show what is the status in malaria. Here is the book. We didn't get it from uh, government, uh, from Malaria Research Center, National Institute of Malaria Research. We bought these books from an uh, old bookshop. And this is how the data tables look like. It's this is the basic data that has been collected. We will say collected within quotes. This is the Plasmodium falciparum. This, these are population year, blood samples collected, blood samples examined, positive for malaria parasite number of falciparums, percentage of falciparum. You won't believe none of this data, which is part of government data, is published yet. So then you find out all these different epidemiological parameters, slight positive ratio, slight falciparum ratio, um, et cetera. And what we found after working for two years is all these data is incorrect. And this is nothing simple. These are, I'll show you what this is. For example, OK, so um, I'll come to that. So it's nothing but one divided by the other. So even in division, there are mistakes. But we corrected the data and then worked. It's quite difficult to work with data because there's incorrect data, missing values. States have been divided, reorganization of districts. There are no maps of olden days anymore, only recent maps. So what we do is, this is one of the parameters that one looks at, slight positive ratio. Total number of blood smears found positive divided by the total number examined into 100. If you take the entire country, this is all it shows. So it's not even nice time series going up and down, so you would like to fit. Here is a data set, which I don't know what to do with, other than saying there was a malaria epidemic in 1976. We plotted each uh, of these 22 states separately. All I could get from here is, when it came, when the um, epidemic came down, state variable variability increased a lot. So I thought about it, that what can we do? This is all that we have. So we went around looking at it, using the, uh, using, doing something what is known as spatiotemporal analysis of prevalence data to simply search for pa patterns of occurrence and some other features. So basically, I have shown you um, uh, that um, you can do um, spatiotemporal analysis of malaria prevalence. 
what I haven't shown you is a statistical modeling technique which doesn't consider any biology of the host completely based on environmental parameters. So, I really don't like it, but that's what is what how much host biology do we know to put into such complicated models. And the uh, third one is mathematical model. So, uh, we see that when we use all the three together, we can say a little more about the disease than using only one of them. So, this kind of approach where you use different kinds of uh, uh, you know, multifaceted approach actually allows you to we us to un understand that uh, the host, uh, the host uh, pathogen biology and its spread much more easily, which can be uh, useful for public health. These are the people who actually did the work. The HIV work is primarily my PhD students work. All these are for um, different malaria work, uh, these people. These are people with whom I have had a uh, lot of discussions so, um, about uh, the HIV work primarily. Um, Carl is uh, one of the earliest persons in Europe who uh, did a whole lot of work in, uh, um, in uh, malaria. He does not uh, is not uh, very active now, but uh, we talked about this very long time back, so it was very useful. These are the people who fund me, who kind of uh, um, also give awards and stuff like that. So, I am really um, thankful to them. Uh, and uh, of course, the, the biggest thank goes to you all who came here summer and stay for more than an hour. Thank you very much. <laughs>